WHN presents Books on Trial. Hear ye, hear ye, the Court of Books is now in session. Sterling North presiding. Order in the courtroom. Books on Trial. Another of WHN's dynamic Monday night book debates. Guest critics argue for and against the new bestseller, and then a jury hands down a decision. Tonight's session breaks all precedent in our literary tribunal. Two weeks ago, Exhibit A was John Roy Carlson's fiery document, The Plotters. For the first time in the history of books on trial, this court was unable to complete the trial and therefore recessed until tonight. Once again, critic for the prosecution is Hamilton Fish, ex-congressman from New York. And speaking for the defense is O. John Rocky, formerly of the Justice Department, and chief prosecutor in the sedition trials. After our guests complete the case for and against John Roy Carlson's book, the jury will arrive at a verdict. And now here is our Chief Justice of the Court of Books, author and literary editor of more than 20 leading newspapers, including the New York Post, ladies and gentlemen, Sterling North. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. As you know, tonight we are continuing the trial of the plotters by John Roy Carlson. To sum up briefly what took place in the first session, Mr. Hamilton Fish for the prosecution called the plotters libel, direct lies, an un-American smear attack lacking decency and ethics. Mr. O. John Roggy for the defense called the book an understatement of the dangers of homegrown fascism, praised it as the best possible way to educate the public on matters of mortal danger to our democracy and underlined its factual truth. Mr. Carlson defended his book and himself by saying that 140 million Americans are under the direct fire of hate bullets aimed at all our minorities and at our democratic institutions. Insults flew freely. Mr. Fish, trying to prove obliquely that his opponents were at the very least socialist, occasionally called them so. Mr. Carlson contended that Mr. Fish was a friend of George Sylvester Weirich and had used his congressional prank to mail un-American propaganda, to which Mr. Fish replied an outright lie. There was much ado over the American Legion, the America First Party, and the Bund. Well, gentlemen, I'm glad to have these preliminaries off our chest. We can now get down to the substance of the book, which maintains that we are in great danger of an ultimate fascist revolution in America. Now our critic for the prosecution, Hamilton Fish, steps up with a statement against the plotters. You have 90 seconds, Hamilton Fish. (laughs) Fellow Americans, I am opposed to all forms of intolerance and racial and religious bigotry, individually and collectively. I led practically every fight in Congress for 24 years in behalf of justice and civil rights for the colored people. I was the, I was the author of the Zionist resolution passed by the Congress in 1923 for the establishment of a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine, and naturally I never belonged to any organization that sought to spread racial or religious hatred. I condemn the author of the plotters as having been proven in court not once but in three separate trials as being unreliable and untruthful in his statement. There is virtually nothing in the book that could not have been obtained by merely writing to the organizations referred to, as they would only be too glad to have their principles and platform given the fullest publicity. The real plotters in America, as J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, stated, are communists, fellow travelers, and fifth columnists. I urge the radio audience to buy my book, The Challenge... The challenge of world communism, which exposes the real plotters in America, and not the fake ones that Mr. Derunium Carlson sets up to knock down. The court record shows him to be untruthful and a character assassin. The truth in the hands of this man is so distorted it becomes a perversion. He used despicable devices, falsification, deception, and treachery. He's responsible for poisoning the minds of thousands of Americans. I'm sorry, Mr. Fish, you will have a chance to expand on that poisoning. Uh, <laughs> but uh, at the moment, here is old John Rogge with his views in favor of John Roy Carlson's book. What have you to say in defense of the book on trial, Mr. Rogge? Judge, I have an objection to make, and I don't want it to count as part of my 90 seconds. What is the objection? I object for cause to Hudson DePriest, who is juror number two in the front row, on the ground that he was a defendant in two of the sedition indictments. Now, now it's true that those indictments were dismissed, but that dismissal was on legal, technical grounds, 
and not based on the merits or on the facts. Furthermore, Mr. DePriest is discussed in the first book that Mr. Carlson wrote, Undercover, and I think for those reasons, I am entitled to challenge him for cause. Not only that, Judge, but last Friday night when I was over at a meeting in Brooklyn, a meeting attended by Coglinites and Christian fronters and members of the Christian mobilizers whom I immediately recognized, I saw this man, Hudson the Priest, sitting five rows in front of me, immediately to my right. Well, now, gentlemen, gentlemen. It was right after that meeting that when I came out, some of the members in that audience slugged me over the head. <laughs> gentlemen, this is the most uh, sensational uh, development. Like yes, yeah, uh, yes, please. Mr. Are we living in free America, or is this a form of Soviet Russia? Well, let me ask you that. Let me I don't, I don't I care. I finish my statement. I thought in America that a man was innocent until proved guilty. And I think that's good American practice. Well, I know nothing I about this case. It. I can see Gentlemen, this is the most sensational development that's ever disturbed the court of books on trial. Uh, Mr. Rogge, are you asking for a mistrial by any chance? I am not only asking for it, I'm demanding it. And I concede it in my opening... <laughs> Gentlemen, gentlemen, gentlemen. Well, the court I conceded, the I conceded that those sedition indictments were dismissed, but I don't care what country we're in, what country we would be in, for cause. The man is prejudiced against this book by very reason that he was Mr. associated Rogers. with that group and also discussed in the first book, and I don't care what happened to the sedition indictment. You may. Mr. The priest, will you step to the microphone, please? Uh, is this that in the first place, in the first place, I wasn't discussed in the book. My, my name was merely mentioned as one of those that were, were, were unjustly indicted. And uh, Mr. Rogge himself left me out of the third indictment. The grand jury left me out. There were 11 of us left out. I had absolutely nothing to do with any of this stuff. It was an un... It was a... a, a uh, the indictment... He, did, he wasn't responsible for the indictment against me. This man wasn't. Uh, it was somebody else that they dismissed from the... Uh, in disgrace from you the case. at that time, didn't you, Mr. Rogge? Mr. Carlson, what do you think about this? I've got one well, thing to say, though. Wait just a moment. Pardon me. You know that in a court of law, it would be possible to challenge a biased juror, but you also know that the jurors here were chosen by lot from the studio audience. And in a city the size of New York, you get a rather wide variance of political opinion. I think I'm going to leave it up to the defendant and ask Mr. Carlson. Mr. Carlson, do you want the court to declare a mistrial? Well, Judge, in the uh, last few days, I've faced thugs, and uh, prior to that, I've faced hate mongers and goons of all kinds. I don't think that uh, this gentleman can do me any particular harm. As far as I'm concerned... Ladies and gentlemen, the trial will continue as we planned, and uh, Mr. Rogge, I believe you still have your 90 seconds in which to sum up your case. Thank you. I should like to summarize in a paragraph the great value of Carlton's book, The Plotters, and then comment on the phrase red fascism, which Mr. Fish used no less than twice in the broadcast over this station two weeks ago. Carlton's book, in my opinion, performs a great service because it helps keep us aware of the fascist threat to democracy. The major burden of defending us against this threat has to be borne by education. In the field of education, as I pointed out two weeks ago, I know of no single item which are better than Carlson's two volumes, first Undercover and now The Plotter. I hope he keeps up his good work. The only omission I noted was with reference to the Columbian. And as Mr. Carlson pointed out at the broadcast two weeks ago, he was abreast of their activities. And the reason he did not relate them in his book was because of the time element. If the Columbians continue with their activities, I hope those activities will be described in his next book. In his book, Mr. Carlson relates not only the activities of the fascists, but also of the communists. I think the most important part of the present book points out the appeals that are being made and will be made, not only by fascists, but also by communists to veterans. Now, I should like to comment on the phrase red fascism, which Mr. Fish used, as I've stated, no less than twice. Of course, there are important similarities between fascism and communism, but there are also important differences. And I wonder whether the phrase red fascism which has apparently become one of the current cliches of the members of the anti-democratic movement in this country, is any help to clear thinking, or whether it doesn't result in muddying the water. 
Thank you, Mr. Rage. You can make even further differentiation in the future if you wish, but your 90 seconds are up. It's now time for the author to say a word on his own behalf. Speaking in defense of his own book, the author himself, John Roy Carlson. My book has many facets, agreeable to fair-minded Republicans and Democrats, disagreeable to unenlightened members of both parties. The Plotters is an assault on bigotry, whether anti-Catholic, anti-Jewish, anti-Negro, or anti -uh any other minority. This social cancer, bigotry, has been coursing dangerously through the life stream of our nation, despite the lame professions of yesterday's bigots, who today pose lamely as champions of tolerance. Bigotry must be checked now. By publicly exposing rabble-rousers, the unchristian clergy, and demagogues who in the name of patriotism are leading our country down the brink of totalitarian ruin, I'll try to warn the American people, alert them to the presence of destructive forces before it is too late. While our boys were fighting overseas, these homebred patriots tried to help Hitler win. And now, disappointed that Hitler lost, they are working day and night to capture post-war's most precious prize, the mind of the veteran. My book is a warning against these saboteurs of democracy. There's an old saying, the dogs yelp and howl and the snakes hiss, but the caravan marches on. The howling hyenas cannot stop the caravan of democracy. Democracy will rise above the ruins of yesterday's Hitler and the gebels in our country today. So let the mad dogs bark and the rattlesnakes hiss. The mighty caravan of democracy will reach its ultimate goal, justice and dignity and freedom to all men, everywhere. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Mr. Fish, would you like to take up Mr. Carlson's challenge that the right wing of American politics is attempting in various ways to capture the veteran vote? I don't believe the right wing are trying to capture the vote. I think the American veterans are able to think for themselves and being good Americans, they'll vote either the Democratic or Republican ticket according to their own conscience. My objection to the book is that the author has built up for himself a reputation of unreliability, irresponsibility, and untruthfulness. And I'd like to ask some questions. Being a prosecutor, I think I have that right of the witness. And there, outside of my remarks, I propose to question the reliability and credibility of the author. I say to you, Mr. DeRunion, did you not boast that there would be no libel suits against you for writing undercover? When did I boast? When did I say a, say a thing like that? Well, you know better than what you say than I do. Well, I don't remember making any such statement. You deny such a thing. I don't remember make, ever making such a statement. Well, what, would you say, what would you say to this? What have you to say regarding the statement made by federal court Judge John P. Barnes on September 25, 1946, well, referring to you as author of The Undercover? Quote, I think this book was written by a wholly irresponsible person who would write anything for a dollar. I wouldn't believe this author if he was under oath. I have filed an, I have filed an affidavit of prejudice against the judge, which the judge admitted, and thereby granted me a venue of uh, court, and I would also refer his honor to the FBI and to Army Intelligence, both of which examined me over a period of three years, and thereby had far more opportunity to judge my veracity, my integrity, my truthfulness as a witness and as a reporter than a biased and prejudiced judge. Mr. Mr. Roddy, do you object to this? Uh, Mr. Roddy, do you object to this line of questioning? I don't object to the line of questioning, Judge, but I want to put in my word on something as to which I have personal knowledge, since Mr. Fish is repeating a quotation that he made the time before, and that's this. I had the occasion to read undercover, page by page, and line by line, and covered, I should say, at least 90% of the book in that way with reference to the sedition trial. And to you that, and I'm basing my statement not only on the testimony of this one witness, but on that of many other witnesses on whom I had evidence completely apart from Mr. Carlson. And I can say to you that I found no instance in which there was any misstatement in the book. On the contrary, there were a number of instances in which I thought he had understated the facts. 
And I would like to add that testimony, my own personal testimony, as to the reliability of Mr. Carlson. Now, may I just Mr. say... I want to address the witness as far as possible and not the defense lawyer. This statement made by this federal court judge, Judge John P. Barnes, was made after six or seven days of testimony on your book taken in open court before a jury. And the jury of 12 men, Americans, found you guilty. The jury they found you guilty. Isn't that a fact? No, that's Mr. a Carson? lie. If you want to ah. call a liar, now you're, you've exposed yourself as a liar. The jury did not find me guilty. The plaintiff had sued for $100,000, claiming his reputation was worth $100,000. The jury said your reputation is one uh, inflated dollar. That's right. Exactly. And I think that the, the lawyers were extremely disappointed, and so was his honor. That doesn't the change verdict. the fact that they came in with a guilty verdict. That changes the, the alters the fact the that... The amount of money you're talking about, the guilty, was verdict. Now, yeah, go on again. Now, wait, one, wait, at time, time, wait, wait, one at a time, gentlemen. One at a time. One at a time. If a man's reputation is considered to be $100,000 and a jury returns a verdict of $1, I think that man... Well, if one man holds out, fresh. he may not even get a there verdict. But 12 men agree that you're guilty, you're guilty. Mr. Rocky. Well, uh, instead of all this argument about what one federal judge may have said, why not have the prosecuting attorney point out where he knows of his own personal knowledge any material misstatements in any of these books. Mr. Fish, Mr. Fish, of your own personal knowledge, where is there a misstatement well, I shall, uh, in this book? conduct my own cross-examination. <laughs> now, my own cross-examination, if what I say is perhaps immaterial, what judges say, now isn't it a fact? What the judge says is material? That you were fined $10,000 as a result of a libel suit brought against you by Jeremiah Stokes in Salt Lake City. I was not fined $10,000. It was a verdict of $10,000, which is now on appeal. And what you're saying it pertains uh, to undercover. Uh, now, we are discussing the plotter. I'm discussing your reliability. <laughs> All right. If you're, I'm if you're discussing your back. reliability. One at a time, please, Mr. And Fish. in that, I want to say that 12 men again found you guilty and fined you $10,000. Mr. Carlson. Is that a fact or is it? It is a jury trial which is now under appeal. Now, the, you said yourself a minute ago that a man is not guilty unless he's proven so. The case is on appeal. But, but you were found guilty after trial by 12 men. Well, I concede that. In two that. different trials. I concede that, but well, many you, a trial has been... argue about it. No, I concede that. But many a trial has been reversed after appeal. Judge, I'd like to have my say now. Yeah, now the now. third trial. Shall I go on the third trial? There Just is no a moment, Mr. Trial. Fish. May I ask uh, one question of, of the defendant? Uh, would you mind telling us in a few words what that particular trial uh, referred to, Mr. Carlson, so the audience isn't in complete darkness as to what we're talking about? It was a trial filed against me by four men in Salt Lake City, suing for $400,000. I won three, and in this fourth instance, uh, the man admitted he had been an associate of Mrs. Dilling and also sponsored two meetings for Gerald L.K. Smith. This man got a verdict of $10,000. The case is now under appeal. And I'm confident that I will get justice in Salt Lake City. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Uh, Mr. Fish, go on with your third trial. Proceed again. Isn't it a fact that in the suit brought against you by Mr. Chapman in Boston that you had to withdraw and repudiate the charges you made against him? Uh, Mr. After the evidence was presented against Mr. Chapman in a series of depositions, Mr. Chapman fainted. He went out to the gentleman's room and he didn't come back. He had fainted. Uh, after which he asked for money. We gave him no money. He said, will you give a retraction? And uh, gave a retraction stating that you, you, you did not call me a Nazi. And I said, I'll be glad to do that. And I gave him a retraction, a mild retraction of four lines. Now, wait till I finish. In which I said, I did not call you a Nazi. If that fellow had a case, he would have taken it to open court. You know that as well, a lawyer. He took it to the court. And he did not take it to court. After court action. He did not take it to took court. It to the judge. He did not take it to but the it was judge. A court action, anyhow. He did, did not take it to the judge. He did not. He did not take it to the judge. He did not. The jury. He did not. No, I mean, you know. Well, I want to say this with reference Mr. to Mr. Uh, Conrad Chapman. I had occasion to make a personal investigation there, and I can tell you that he's a member of the anti-democratic movement and operated not only in this country but also in Europe. Well, I'd like to have you expand on that, please. I don't think Mr. he's in Rodney? the discussion. The facts are what the courts decided and not what you think about some individual. He may have some views Judge, about you. May I have a statement Mr. to make Carlson. here? 
Now, I'm going to quote the, his, uh, the, the plaintiff there has uh, made a lot of cracks, and I'd like to quote from a magazine which he may call a uh, communist organ. It happens to be an editorial in the New York Herald Tribune, in my opinion, <laughs> the, the finest Republican paper in the country. October 25th, 1942. The truth is that Mr. Fish's capacity for wrong-headedness, deviousness, and short-sightedness has been established beyond the possibility of rebuttal. Yes. Uh, 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 Your Honor, Your Honor, Wait till I finish, please. please. Wait till I finish. That is no court action. That's a partisan newspaper, which I've opposed for a great many years <laughs> and still oppose. Very well. And Very I well. still think it's loaded down with reds, too. Gentlemen, let's... <laughs> Gentlemen, in its literary, and in its literary department, uh, Order in the courtroom, please. Many people do not know today, but they will know in the future. Mr. Fish, can we get back to the book? Can uh, I'm going to ask you, Charles, you ask can me we get about back to the book and the paper. I'm going to ask you this question. Did, well, you, write an article, did you write now, an wait, article, article in the, the magazine book. Soviet Russia Today on November 36, in November 1936, giving a glowing and complimentary account of the communist revolution in Armenia which resulted in a Soviet regime. You're certainly digging the old ghosts out of nowhere. I have testified under oath that I have not, did not write that article. Now Mr. stick to the book, Hans. Mr. Rogge, the book. Please, uh, please, uh, Mr. Rogge. I'm making the same objection that the author is. Why can't we discuss the book instead of going into all these irrelevancies that have nothing to do with it? Judge, if, if, I'll, if I'll 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 insist on going outside of the issues of the book, I've got a lot right. of documents here that well, I have a bunch of material here under those circumstances well, got, that will take me a considerable time if we're going to get much. into these personalities. Gentlemen, gentlemen who talk about the trial, gentlemen, the mass trial, gentlemen, gentlemen, just a moment, please. You here. all have briefcases full of indictments, documents, <laughs> newspaper clippings, things that were said beautiful about you and evilly about the other. May I get back well, to the book? Well, I'll say about this book, then. It's not a fact that the 15 so-called plotters mentioned in this book who are dead and have been dead from one to five years. Who are you talking about? I'm talking about the, all these, like Newton Jenkins and Raskob and all these different now, wait, people that wait. you mentioned. Raskob has not mentioned the plotters and Newton Jenkins died even before undercover was with I know he died, him. but you, you mentioned him. I mentioned that he had you died. Of course he's dead. Well, I mentioned that he was dead. And I don't see how they, I don't see how they can be plotters if they're dead. But they're not in the plotters. They they're are. The they're mentioned in Pardon the me, gentlemen. I'll gentlemen, Hitler, Hitler is dead and Mussolini is dead, and I don't see that that's relevant. Uh, I, don't, I, 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 I insist, Your Honor, that a man is not Mr. a plotter Rodden. if he's a dead. But well, he's not in the book. Elaborate. One at a time. I want to elaborate on the point. The evil that these men do in the case of fascism certainly lives after them. Now, if you've had... In this international movement, you've had various people all over the world that have stoked these fires of hatred, and their death hasn't removed those hatreds which they've left behind them. And in bringing any such picture up to date, it's necessary to go back and describe them. If anyone were going to describe the international fascist movement, they couldn't do that without talking about Hitler and Mussolini. They've been dead a long time, but the movement's still with us. So with members of the anti-democratic movement in this country. The fact that they're dead well, doesn't I, remove the... I Mr. disagree with you entirely. Fascism and Nazism are both dead in America. Oh. Oh. Both dead. Despite Mr. Darunian and Carlson's efforts to revive them. Communism, I regret to say, is very much alive. We are already at war, a war of words and propaganda and nerves. A war between freedom and slavery, between democracy and totalitarianism, and between Christianity and faith in God and militant atheism. There is no compromise between Americanism and communism. And Mr. Darunian <laughs> gave 23 pages to communism, slapping them on the wrist, and 360 to a lot of small American organizations <laughs> who stand for constitutional government by and large. And you gave 5,000 pages to communism, maybe 10 pages to the investigation of fascism when you were investigating those outfits. Mr. Rogge. The fact that people can make statements present time that fascism is dead in the United States shows all the more the need for the books of the type that Carlson has written. <laughs> where you have such things as the revival of the Ku Klux Klan, where you have the Colombians, where you have people like Rangel, Rankin, and Bilbo operating in the Senate, where you have discrimination in various phases of our national life, in education, well, in employment, I'd in like the colleges, in housing. Now. 
where you already have those fascist tendencies on the fascist side of the picture. How can anyone say that fascism's dead in the United States? Do you, sir? 30 seconds for you and 30 seconds for Carlson, and we wind but it I up. I want to ask you a few questions here. I'm not, well. not listening to these speeches. Are the, National, are the National Association of Manufacturers, the Small Businessmen's Association, and the National Association of Real Estate Boards mentioned in the plotters, dangerous plotters, for defending free enterprise against government controls? Mr. Carlson, no. answer that question. No, they're please. not. They're not, but they have a certain viewpoint which I do not think represents the welfare of the entire nation. Now, let me end on this note. You you, you, you make such a hullabaloo about communists. Now, if I were to ask you a definition of no, a I, communist... I asked you a you question and you come back I've answered it. I've answered it. I've answered it. Now, you call the New York Herald Tribune a communist party. I do not. Well, I do yes, not. I said the Reds on it and I can prove it. Oh, nonsense. I know Reds who they the are and they're Tribune. in the literary... <laughs> Well, your well, type I of say it. We probably no, never can't. will be able to find out whether the New All York right. Herald Tribune is red or not. I'm sorry to interrupt, no, gentlemen. But radio time waits for no man, and the jury is about to reach a verdict. While the jury is deciding in favor of or against the plotters, here's a brief sketch of the chief exhibit for next week's session of the Court of Books. Next week, believe it or not, Books on Trial is going to deal with literature. <laughs> Louis Cronenberger's anthology, The Pleasure of Their Company, will be defended by that wicked wit, impertinent poet, and gifted sophisticate, Dorothy Parker. In the opposite corner, waiting to do battle at the drop of an anthology, will be that gifted radio announcer, news analyst, and expert on Mayan Indian culture, Ben Grower. From Petronius to Beerbohm and from Erasmus to Aldous Huxley, we hope to have the pleasure of their company. No name will be sacred in the entire realm of writing. Literary illusions will fly like poisoned arrows as the prosecution attempts to prove that one man's wit is another man's anthology. Don't miss our chance to seem literate once uh, upon books on trial. Your Honor, the jurors have completed their balloting on the plotters. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have. What is your decision? We, the jury, vote 11 to 1 in favor of the book on trial. Thank you, members of the jury, for helping us tonight in completing the trial of the product. We'd like to show our appreciation to each of you with a copy of the book specially autographed by the author. And our heartiest thanks to O. John Rodney, Hamilton Fish, and John Roy Carlson for their lively contribution to Books on Trial. Members of the listening audience are invited to attend the Radio Court of Books. If you'd like tickets to next week's session, simply write to Books on Trial, WHN, New York City. You have a chance to be chosen from the audience to vote on the book and receive a copy autographed by the author. Send that postcard tonight for tickets. Now a final word from Sterling North. Be with us again next Monday evening for a trial, the trial of Lewis Cronenberger's new anthology, The Pleasure of Their Company. We can promise you a scintillating discussion when Ben Grower and Dorothy Parker meet to attack and defend the book. Until then, this is Sterling North saying good night and good reading. Books on Trial, a public service to us of the station to which you're listening, comes to you from the studio theater of the Barbizon Plaza Hotel. Court is adjourned until next Monday night at 8 o'clock.